in this review, we're going to talk about phase transitions. And in particular, we're gonna talk about the competition between thermodynamics and kinetics. So imagine a you know single component, a simple system, keeping pressure constant and varying temperature. We had this picture of temperature and Gibbs free energy, in which we had some, let's try to get that curvature right, huh? There we go. And let's say this is a uh, G of the liquid phase and G of the solid phase. And we would say, okay, so we're in the liquid phase at some temperature and we're cooling down. We cool, 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 cool. And at some point, we come to the place where the liquid and the solid touch. That is the melting temperature. And in the case of thermodynamics, we say, okay, well, that's the point where it transitions. Well, that's a thermodynamic definition. Is the definition of thermodynamic equilibrium. And with T less than T melting, then everything should change. But our real system has liquid. And what we've actually done was we've created a small volume of solid. And in the process, we created surface. So in order for our system to transition, we actually have to undercool and will stay as a liquid for a while following the uh, liquid free energy curve. And that will allow for undercooling. So this is delta T of our undercooling. And as we do that, we are creating a delta G V, V to stand for volumetric that drives the transition. And it drives it by overcoming that surface energy. So to get an expression for that, we're going to look at what's happening near equilibrium. So delta G V is equal to delta H V minus T delta S V at equilibrium, that's going to be equal to zero, which lets us say that delta S V is equal to delta H V over T. And it's at equilibrium, so it's a melting temperature. We know exactly the temperature. And remember, that's our latent heat. So delta H V is equal to L. Sometimes you see that in textbooks. Uh, I'm just gonna call it delta H V for here. Now, if we approximate near T is equal to T M, delta H V is about constant. And that's not a bad approximation if you're near uh, and, and you're within a small region in uh, temperature. And that means that we can say delta GV is equal to delta HV minus T delta H V over T M, substituting or adding in a one there, which is equal to T M over T M. This becomes 
delta H V of E T M minus T over T M. So that is our delta T of undercooling. So that gives, gives us an expression, delta G V for undercooling of approximately delta H V delta T over T M. And near the near the transition point, that, that's a pretty good assumption. But then going back up and looking at our system, we could talk about what's happening. And in this, we can approximate, and it's again a very good approximation that we're creating some spherical, some spherical uh, precipitate. And this is going to be the case of a solid and a liquid. If you're doing a, a solid and a solid, you may have some anisotropies, but solid and liquid, this is a good approximation. Then we are transforming the volume from solid to liquid, which means we are changing energy by 4 thirds pi r cubed delta G V. And at the same time, we're creating surface which will be four pi r squared gamma. And looking at these again, this is going to be less than zero because delta G V is less than zero because uh, Tm and delta Hv are both greater than zero, but delta T is going to be less than zero if we're undercooling. And the surface energy, this whole term is always going to be uh, greater than zero because all those terms are greater than zero, which gives us a picture, whoops, which gives us a picture that looks like R, so that R is the uh, radius, that R is the radius of our uh, uh, nucleus, and G, get R squared to the surface, we get something that goes as R cubed due to volume. And that gives us delta G tote, which is equal to 4 thirds pi R cubed delta V, delta G V plus four pi r squared gamma. And the maximum there, the place where that is flat, is r star. If you happen to have a nucleus of solid where r is less than r star, then surface energy wins and it will shrink. And uh, R larger than R star, then the volume wins and it will grow. So identifying that R star, we can do by taking D by dr of delta G tote. which gives us 
which gives us 4 pi r squared delta g v plus 8 pi r gamma. Set that equal to 0. Solve for r is equal to r uh, star. And that gives us r star is equal to minus 2 gamma over delta g v. So that is the radius. And we know that our system, you know, even though we have the uh, the energy, the average energy of the system, uh, we know it's, it's not uniform. We know that, you know, just in the room, the molecules in the room all have different energies and they have an average kinetic energy, which gives us temperature. And in the same way in our liquid, we have regions with more or less energy and we're constantly sampling. So if it so happens that we can overcome this barrier, so that is equal to delta G tote at R star, then we're able to grow. So if there is enough energy in, to overcome that barrier, we'll see growth. So we can solve for that by substituting. We can substitute uh, R star in to delta G tote. Delta G tote at R star is equal to delta G star is equal to 16 pi, uh, sorry, 16 pi gamma cubed over 3 delta H V squared times the melting temperature squared over delta T squared. Sorry about the interruption there. My uh, software seemed to suddenly quit working. Uh, so let's uh, let's let's talk about the implications of this. We see that uh, well within this, the only thing that we can really control is delta t, right? Everything else is is a fixed material property, and you might try you know different doping strategies, but Really, this delta T is 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 what is in our uh, purview. So, delta T, increasing delta T, recognizing that increasing delta T is actually opposite of T, right? You're we're cooling as we're increasing delta T. So, uh, as we're cooling, making delta T larger, we are uh, changing R star, and let me, uh, R star, make, if we make a substitution to gamma T melt over delta H V delta T. So R star goes as one over delta T. And more importantly, delta G star goes as one over delta T squared. So here we're going to see a very rapid decrease of delta G star. So it, it's very sensitive. Now, thinking about thinking about the uh, distribution of energies in, in, a, in a system, we can say, okay, so what's the probability that we overcome this energy barrier, which again, this is going to be an Arrhenius type behavior, which means that we'll have some N star, the number of uh, critical nucleus or number of nucleus that are, are smaller than that critical size 
which is going to, to equal some well prefactor, and the prefactor has to do with, with system sampling. Uh, and then exp of minus delta G star over KT. So we return to intervenous distribution. Uh, just further, uh, we can talk about we can talk about the nucleation rate if we recognize that it is in part the in part the uh, probability of, of having a critical size coupled with diffusion. And, and that's because when we're solidifying, we're necessarily solidifying a composition that's different from the composition of the solid. I mean, if if we have a, a if we have a, a, a two phase system, so let's sorry two phase a, a, a two component system. So talking to about more complex systems. And, and it's going to go as again a prefactor over at plus delta e d. So that's. Uh, all this diffusion and, and these are are in competition with each other, with each other and and the reason they're in competition with each other is because as you cool the system down the rate of diffusion decreases Right, and we also know that this delta G star will increase as we cool it down. So, what that means is it means that if we have this, and just call it I will call it n dot for rate of nucleation versus temperature. At T melt, we'll see, you know, immediate uh, nucleation. And as we get to lower temperatures, we're going to see that coming down. So we'll have something that looks like this. But this is delta T. This is T. If we're sitting kind of in review, if we're sitting at the melting temperature, then we're going to have a, a relatively small amount of uh, few nuclei and fast fusion and over here we have many nuclei because we have a large undercooling but slow diffusion and then in the middle you're going to have some optimal So this picture is, is a picture for homogeneous nucleation. And by that, I mean it's nucleation 
uh, just in the bulk. But most of the time, we actually witness heterogeneous nucleation. And in that, you'll have your system. And your system is not just hanging out in space, right? Your, your metal, for example, you, you've poured that into a mold. And when you nucleate, you don't nucleate a sphere. Rather, you nucleate on the surface. And the reason that that happens is because when you're destroying the surface area, you're returning energy. So you can have a smaller volume of liquid. So we can say that our our uh, delta G tote is equal to delta G. We'll just put a prefactor in there. Let's call this a uh, call this uh, a v or alpha G delta G v volumetric. B O L U plus uh, this is the surface energy to create surface. Right? And that is the solid liquid surface plus uh Call this S1, call this S2. This is the energy to destroy surface. And this is the area here. So I, I gave this uh, SL for solid liquid because we're creating solid liquid surface. And here I'm calling it LM for liquid mold because we're destroying some of the liquid mold surface. And I'm not going to go through and derive this. Uh, it really depends heavily upon geometry. Uh, I would direct you to Porter and Easterling if you want to see uh, uh, some detailed derivations on this. But I will simply point out that over here in terms of your nucleation rate, uh, if this is uh, your homogeneous nucleation rate, your heterogeneous nucleation rate, let's make that in blue, is going to be shifted so that a at a smaller degree of undercooling, you'll see the nucleation, and it's going to be significantly faster. So yes, homogeneous nucleation is possible, and it does happen, but uh, really heterogeneous nucleation is going to dominate. So talking about, talking about this type of, of uh, nucleation rate and, and, and growth rate, we're going to you know, continue this in, in which we have uh, diffusion and uh, nucleation controlling the process. And you think to yourself, wouldn't it be nice if we could control the temperature, because we can, uh, in order to get the microstructure that we want. And we can do we can do that, and we represent this in what we call a uh, TTT curve. Time 
temperature transformation. My handwriting on this is just dreadful. I'm sorry about that. I'm temperature transformation. So if we have, for example, temperature T and time, we can hold and say this is going to be our uh, melting temperature for whatever you have, or maybe our, our, uh, uh, our uh, liquidus temperature. We have some degree of undercooling. Up to T. And we can look at the time that it takes for a transition to start. And then, you know, watching the system, we'll say, for example, see some solid phases start at that particular degree of undercooling. And we'll watch them grow. As time passes. And at some point, they're complete. So we have start, stop, and then all through here, we can have different degrees of completion. So say 50%, etc. And if we do that for a variety of temperatures, we'll get something that looks like this. these C curves. And with this type of TTT curve, right, this type of TTT curve, we can talk about cooling below the transition temperature, holding, and then if you want to, we can increase the temperature or decrease the temperature and change the rate of transition until we cross the stop line. And again, this is something that was studied uh, and presented in detail in Porter and Easterling uh, what's important to recognize is that these transitions can be studied for a variety of phases that are competing with each other in a phase diagram, and we can essentially move between the onset of transition and completion for the phases in order to control the phases presence and the amount present. So these are diagrams that allow us to control the kinetics. So briefly moving forward, I want to discuss the microstructures and some diffusion related effects. <clears throat> so imagine a microstructure or imagine imagine a phase diagram that is this shape. We have some, again, some simple lens, liquid, some alpha, alpha plus liquid. And imagine us solidifying okay, from here. Well, solidifying at that point, 
we'll have a system that is mostly liquid with a few small nucleus of alpha. The composition of that alpha, and I want to make this red and this blue for A and B, the composition of that is very A-rich. And what that necessarily means is it means that the liquid will be less A-rich than the than the alpha. It also means that if you had some picture here in which you had some position, in here you'd have X B alpha. Let's call this B. You'd have X B liquid. And here you have some depletion. of the B atoms. And that has the effect of making this liquid not appear as though it's, it's right here, but it actually looks as though it's a little bit further to the right. I mean, after all, right, we're, we're looking at a point here, which is below what the equilibrium should be. And cooling then Further, you still get something which is A-rich, but that again will lead to depletion, which will lead to this constant shift down the diagram. And you'll wind up with this nucleation that becomes more and more dilute in A and more and more rich in B. Oops. More and more rich in B. So this phenomena in which you have a gradient in your, so let's imagine we have our, our crystals here, you have a gradient in which you have more A on the inside and more B on the outside, that's referred to as coring. And it has to do with having a diffusion uh, barrier on, on the, uh, at the interface. Let's, continue here. I want to talk a little bit about, oops, about the eutectic microstructure. So we had this eutectic phase diagram right and a simple eutectic phase diagram looks like this so again look but and you know we can have more complex ones as well but alpha alpha plus liquid beta plus liquid beta alpha plus beta and as we discussed if you're cooling here you'll create alpha 
and liquid. And ideally, you'd pass into the alpha plus beta. retaining alpha and then creating a eutectic microstructure of the eutectic composition. And what's happening here, you know, again, you can still have that coring effect. So you may or may not have coring, but the important thing, and, and what I want to emphasize at this point, is that the eutectic microstructure is not eutectic phase, not a phase, it's a microstructure. And uh, that microstructure is made of your alpha phase and your beta phase, uh, but it is, is a microstructure. And the shape of that microstructure is going to be something like alpha, beta, alpha, beta. And then you have some others. You know, you can have other alpha, beta, alpha beta, alpha. And what's important to recognize is that when this forms and it forms in your liquid, it forms and it grows much more rapidly than these homogeneous alpha shapes. Or that that's why this microstructure is well present, right? A, a, a simple way of thinking might be say, oh, as soon as I come down here, what I'm going to get is alpha, alpha, alpha. And then I'm going to get some beta and some alpha. And this is going to occupy it that way. And, and that's that's not what happens. And the reason is that when alpha and beta can form at the same time, remember, that means that we have a common tangent line, so they're in equilibrium. They can form at the same time, and you think to yourself, oh, what if we had, what if we had, whoops, liquid, and then we had alpha, in beta form, well, then this alpha would, well, as it grew, it'd be absorbing A atoms, and the beta would be absorbing B atoms, and that's just because we know from this diagram that the beta is B rich and the alpha is A rich. And in order for them to grow, we would necessarily have diffusion of the B atoms near the alpha and the A atoms near the beta toward each other. So instead of having these two homogeneous nucleated structures, it's a lot more convenient to have alpha and beta grow right next to each other. So instead of having this long range transport of B atoms and A atoms in, they can transport laterally. So the B atoms near the alpha interface, alpha liquid interface, will be able to transport laterally. And in the same fashion, the A atoms near the beta interface 
will be able to trans diffuse laterally. So in this situation, you know, you're, you're talking, you know, tens to hundreds of micron. And here, this is, you know, one to 10 micron. So it's much more rapid diffusion because the distance is shorter. Uh, so talking about these eutectic microstructures, and again, the Porter and Easterling textbook does a, a good job of, of deriving this, but there is a uh, relationship between delta T undercooling, the spacing, the intrinsic spacing between these, and the surface energy, right? If the surface energy between alpha and beta phase is really, really high, then that means that that uh, high energy will win out uh, compared to the diffusion. So you'll wind up with a relatively large spacing in your, your eutectic phase. If instead the energy is really small, then you get a very fine structured eutectic phase uh, and the, the lath are very close to each other. And kind of in a, in a last, last point here, which again is going to be a very brief, uh, I'd like to discuss the uh, paratectic phase tr transition. And the paratectic is, is well, it's actually pretty cool because I, 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 well, I think it's pretty cool. Um, and I say that because ah, my pen cut out again. Sorry about that. I had the uh, drawing program lock up on me again. So we were going to talk about uh, paratechnics, right? So let's have a, a simple paratectic phase diagram. Let's make like pterodactyl or something, I guess, but. Uh, <laughs> Well, anyway, plus beta, 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 plus liquid. Yeah, I, I, I've never actually seen a, a real phase diagram that looks like this, but uh, you do get this type of paratectic, and, and the paratectic is this point where you have liquid plus alpha going to beta. So basically, it is two phases turning into one, whereas the eutectic, the eutectic is here. Where you have one phase turning into into one. And there's different Greek endings depending on what the compositions are, but uh, solid versus liquid. But this is a paratectic. So uh, the interesting thing here is that, and well, say we start up at this point in liquid, we cool down in that region. We have liquid, and we have some alpha phase. And here, when we cross the paratectic temperature, we see the alpha phase disappearing and the beta phase reappearing, or appearing for the first time. and. Uh, the point here is that above the paratectic transition, you have alpha
which is A rich, and you have liquid, which is B rich, and when you cross, you now have a uh, liquid, which is still B rich, and beta, which is, is uh, well, less so. Okay. So in order to form the beta, you have to have the liquid and the alpha phases combined. So what occurs at this point is you get beta phase that forms on the exterior, or I should say the surface, that's a better way to draw it, shouldn't I? Let's draw this uh, as the uh, the surface of the alpha making beta because in order, well, to minimize the impact of diffusion, and again, we're looking at all possible pathways, but some are faster than others. Well, the ones that fastest is going to be a, a situation where the liquid and the alpha come together to grow the beta because the alpha has to go away. So there's interest in, in seeing that uh, shrink. And at the same time, uh, we need to have a beta phase, which is a combination of the alpha and, and the liquid. And then the liquid phase will have uh, will be over here in the uh, very B rich section. So that's where I'd like to stop with the review. Uh, thank you for your time.